The World Behind the Wall, Global Backgrounds of Maps and Ambitions in 16th Century Italy, the Giuseppe Marcocci. Monsieur Marcocci, a professor associé de l'histoire moderne um, à l'Université de Viterbo, uh, mais aussi professeur associé à l'Université de Florence. Uh, il a publié uh, plusieurs livres uh, dans les derniers temps. Le, uh, le livre qu'il vient de publier en 2016 chez La Terza, c'est « Indios Chinesi Falsari, l'histoire du monde nel, nel Renascimento ». Mais avant ça, il a aussi publié autour uh, de... Euh, de l'Empire portugais et euh, aussi autour de l'Inquisition et l'Église au Portugal. Euh, donc, euh, il est euh, à la fois spécialiste de Portugal, euh, mais aussi du monde méditerranéen et euh, de plus en plus euh, s'intéresse à l'histoire globale. La parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, professeur Subamaniam. Euh, je suis désolé pour parler en anglais, mais euh, je ne maîtrise plus la, la langue, un petit peu. Mais j'espère que mon accent italien euh, aidera Uh, tout à comprendre uh, plus ou moins ce que je veux dire. Uh, well, the, uh, the visual turn in history um, encourages new approaches to uh, maps. And in a way, it uh, relieves them from the rather esoteric expertise of the historians of cartography. So what I want to do today is to focus on um, the cycles of wall maps of the world that were depicted in some palaces of power in mid-16th century Italy. A few cases are rather known, others are not. So I will try to put them in connection. And uh, uh, it is important to, to observe at the beginning of my speech that uh, not all of this uh, production has been the object of uh, scholars because uh, there is a tendency, exactly in the line Professor Subramanian was highlighting, to look at these uh, maps from the point of view of their uh, position regarding the most advanced knowledge in the time. Since many of these maps are not the most advanced product of the time, they have generally been disregarded by historians of cartography. Uh, however, there is uh, some recent interest uh, in, the first, um, in the fact that, I quote Francesca Fiorani, an art historian uh, from Virginia University, uh, by interacti interacting with other symbolic forms, particularly the non-cartographic images surrounding them, these map cycles became the primary vehicles in the construction of political legitimacy, religious supremacy, or universal knowledge. Yet, uh, this perspective, in my view, still looks at them from the inside out. Uh, for instance, it just considers the creators or the persons who realized these maps. And generally, it uh, provides uh, Italian, if not local, interpretations of uh, the, the iconographic programs that were behind these maps. Uh, I will move in another direction today, uh, exploring maps as visual evidence uh, of the global interactions that marked the uh, context of production of these maps. Uh, now, the highest uh, examples of these wall maps uh, are in the hall of the Guardaroba Nuova in, of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence and in the room of the world map in the Villa Farnese at Caparola. I will return to these two famous examples in the second part of my uh, presentation. Uh, probably these two uh, examples drew inspiration from the mid 16th century president of the Scudo Room uh, of the Doge's Palace in Venice. A lesser known case, because um, what we have today are uh, 18th century remakes of the original maps. The original maps uh, uh, were deteriorated and uh, so they were replaced by uh, the current maps we have that are uh, not at all the uh, uh, faithful reproduction of the, of the original, so they are rather different. And this situation uh, is important because um, absence of images is also part of the um, way in which historians can um, deal with uh, the uh, visual sources and the visual turns in history. So I think this is also something which is 
uh, important. Uh, it, was in, it had been in 1550 when the Council of Ten, a political board of the Republic of Venice, uh, ordered to realize a uh, world map on large canvases for the reception room of the Doge's apartment. Since we don't have them, let me quote another passage from a description in the early 17th century of these uh, originals. Uh, they were split into four big pictures, taking up the whole space between the backrest and the ceiling, in which the, this description says, one sees carefully depicted all the parts of the world. Uh, they are relevant, in my view, these maps, uh, of course, for their connection to, uh, with the first long distance exchanges that were uh, uh, occurring in the time, but also for their creator. And I'm not thinking of the famous cartographer Giacomo Castaldi, who was uh, the man who realized it, these maps, but of the secretary of the, ten, of the Council of Ten, of ten who um, personally wrote the contract that we still have for the work, the well-known humanist Giovanni Battista Ramusio. A great collector of travel wrappers, uh, chronicles, and maps, he developed a lively consciousness of the shifting knowledge of the word, also thanks to his experience as diplomat and his close links to major historians of the Iberian explorations, for instance, uh, the Spanish Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo or the Portuguese Damião de Góis, who was in close contact with them. Um, Ramuzzi supported and this is very important in my view, Venice's imperial ambitions to preserve the dominion over coast and islands of the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, a political project that was at the root of his monumental work, Navigazioni et Viaggi, a collection of historical and geographical writings translated into Italian and published in Venice from 1550 on, the same year in which the contract with Gastaldi was signed for the maps. And the coincidence of dates with Gastaldi's appointment uh, is not fortuitous and helps us to understand the kind of message the judge wanted to convey to visitors through word maps. Uh, the instructions to Gastaldi that we have uh, um, attached to the contract show that he was asked to pay special attention to the text selected by Ramuzio for the, Naviga the Navigazioni's first volume, uh, including Hassan al-Vazan al-Garnati al-Fazi, also known as Leo Africanos, for the uh, map of Africa that had to be integrated with al da Cadamosto uh, for the Atlantic shores, a, 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 16th, a 15th century Venetian a uh, traveler who had uh, witnessed the Portuguese explorations up, uh, along the, the African coast. Uh, then Francisco Alvarez, another Portuguese who had visited Ethiopia, uh, had to be followed for the map of uh, the land, what is called in the, in the contract, the land of Prester John, that is the Ethiopia, and Duarte Barbosa for that of the routes of the Portuguese navigations. So this is the initial um, uh, duty that, uh, uh, that Gastaldi had from Ramuzio. And it is evident that initially uh, Venice uh, was just interested, not, was not interested in the world, but was just interested in the regions uh, their commercial rivals, that is in this case the Portuguese, uh, had reached. So there is uh, some political and better commercial interest behind these maps. Uh, a change occurred for political reasons, and is, for practical reasons, sorry, and it is very interesting. Since Gastaldi was not able to keep the deadline for the work and justified himself uh, arguing that in the map of Africa, let me quote him, it is necessary to add to the part that would remain empty that word discovered by the Spaniards 50 years ago. That is, Hispaniola, Cuba, New Spain, the land of Peru, and the Pacific Ocean. So uh, this was the, uh, the way, the reason why we have, uh, we had, no, we don't have any more, but we had this map as completed, not the initial um, 
commitment by the, the initial commission that had been given to uh, Gastaldi, but rather a, a very practical reason that had to be approved by a committee, uh, an official committee that uh, praising this decision, saying that the inclusion of this word and the newfound lands, Paesi Novamente Ritrovati, that was a famous title in, in, in the literature of the um, is early, uh, late 15th, early 16th century, uh, it was to be praised at this inclusion so that not only the Spaniards, but also our own people will recognize them. So there is also a kind of um, civic interest behind these maps. Uh, in, including the, the America, Gastaldi anticipated what we could call the American turn of the Venetian uh, publishers who um, issued an increasing number of books about the New World by Spanish and Italian authors starting from the following years. Uh, the reorientation toward the whole, the whole world of the Scudos Room maps paralleled the preparation of the two new volumes of the Navigaciones by Ramuzio. Um, as is proved, again, by a second uh, contract signed by Gastaldi with the Council of Dan in 1553 for the depiction this time of America and Asia as a unique continental mass, according to the common belief of the time. Here you have a map that is derived from a Gastaldi model that more or less gives us an idea of what we are talking about. Uh, as stated in the contract, Gastaldi, I quote, had to check all the wrappers he will be given of Castilian, so we can to imagine him working with people giving him wrappers about travel literature. And these wrappers are of Castilian captains who went across and wrote about that land, especially Alvaro Nunes, the French Jacques Cartier for New France, Joao de Barros for the geography of China, and the nobleman Marco Polo for Catay. A very interesting mix that is also included in the volumes by Ramuzio that uh, contain both, uh, let's say, medieval and modern uh, authors. And the, the volumes of Ramuzio containing this uh, authors were published exactly in the, the, the second half of the 1550s, so more or less, again, in parallel with uh, this uh, scooter room. Now, uh, the genesis of a wall map of the world, as we have seen, could be complex, and its background was made of a variety of cultural transfer, which might overlap a publishing project with global reach. Moreover, ambition that we rarely credit to, weak, to the weak political powers of 16th century Italy fostered such an undertaking. These ambitions were a mix of trade interest and vague dreams of greatness, and they, but they urged to search for fresh new maps and news information, ensuring a constant flow of materials, a constant know of knowledge towards those Italian centers hoping to keep some role in the world balance of power in redefinition. For example, as early as 1501, when the big news was still Vasco da Gama's journey to India, Angelo Trevisan, a secretary of the Venetian ambassador in Castile, succeeded in taking possession of, I quote, a maps and the region a map to Calicut and the region that are behind it. Uh, and it is very interesting that uh, Trevisan constantly uh, stresses in, in his uh, letters to the Republic of Venice that this map can replace direct experience. So there is already this strong idea that uh, they, um, this visual evidence of this map is something very important from this point of view. Uh, if we can understand, however, this episode of, as part of Venice's reaction to the Portuguese challenge, according to a line that Ramuzio still followed in his discourses on spice, spices were the, the main point of uh, contention between Portuguese and Venetians in, in this period, another famous theft that has already been mentioned by Professor Subramaniam uh, of a, may, a map 
makes things much more complicated. I refer to the Cantino map. I don't need now to repeat the, the, the story. And, but it's interesting that this map was uh, displayed on the walls of the library of the Duke of Ferrara, Ercole d'Est. Uh, it is a very telling map of the Portuguese knowledge of um, uh, the word in the late 15th century. And, uh, however, with respect to the Venetian cases we were considering, this map cannot be uh, understood, was not, the, it, it was reproduced uh, um, illegally by the secret agent Cantina for, for the Lord, but this reproduction cannot be understood as uh, something meant to support the imperial ambitions uh, of Renaissance prince in, in this case, because the, the, du the Duke of Ferrara ruled on uh, a very small state without um, access to the sea. Uh, so this put his case in a very different situation with respect to the Venetian case. Yet uh, this map, this, this uh, search for it, this display of it in, in the library, uh, demonstrate to what extent Italian culture at the time was interested in the new knowledge of the word, uh, shaped by uh, increasing context and exchanges on a global scale. However, it was not just a matter of cartography. Uh, as is shown, for instance, by the octaves of the Canto 15 of Orlando Furioso, a very famous poem of the time, uh, in which uh, Ludovico Ariosto, writing a few years after the reproduction of the Cantino map exactly in the same uh, environment, in the Ferrara court and uh, at, uh, staying in the, in the library in which this map was present, uh, include an account of the, in form of prophecy of the explorations carried out by the Iberians, who, I quote a line from uh, Ariosto, in the manner of the circling sun to seek new lands and new creations run. So there is already also in, in the literature this strong connection with images and the information arriving from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, visualization of the word gained uh, a centrality which encourages to revise uh, established interpretations about 16th century Italy and to rediscover the impact of uh, global connections on places that we tend to keep separate from the front line of overseas explorations and empire building projects. Uh, I think not only of Ariosto's Ferrara, which is an obvious case, but if we move more uh, ahead in time until the mid 16th century, also of the enigmatic cases of frescoes of globes and planisphere realized in isolated localities in Northern Italy. Uh, let me start with the case of the Castle of Manta, uh, which is in today Western Piedmont. Uh, the decoration of the vault of the Hall of Grotesque, dated to 1563, includes a remarkable globe dominated by a crown and surrounded by a scroll uh, with a quotation from Book 6 of the Enaid saying, the spirit nourishes within. And it is interesting, this quotation, because it is taken from a section of Virgil's poem that at the time was generally uh, interpreted as um, uh, one of the many prophecies of the ancients about the discovery of the new world. So it is not by chance that the side of the uh, world we have in the globe is the Atlantic side, because there is a kind of um, clear program here behind. But uh, it is surprising to find uh, uh, this uh, globe in a rather isolated uh, castle that um, belonged to uh, Michele Antonio Saluzzo della Manta, who was at the time the ruler of the Marquisate of Saluzzo in a period in which this Marquisate was annexed to France. Uh, I will return to this political detail because I think it's important. but. Uh, let me move to another not very well-known case, I think. It is uh, uh, another northern I I Italian uh, palace, the Palazzo Besta, which is in uh, Teglio, a village of the Valtellina, uh, an alpine 
uh, region that at the time had been conquered by the Swiss uh, canton of Briance. And uh, this also promoted the uh, penetration of the ideas of reformation in this part of northern uh, Italy. Uh, in the um, ceiling of the room of creation, I'm sorry the image is not very well, but it's clear, we have a, a, a planisphere, which is a, a reproduction of a map by the German Kaspar Vopel. But I'm not exactly interested in the fact of from what model this map was imitated, but more of the context and the, the, the people that were um, around the uh, commissioner of this uh, map, who was Carlo Besta, uh, a, a little lord of northern Italy, that uh, at the time looked for his uh, um, political um, action acting under the shadow of a wider power, the, the, the Grayons. Uh, he was married to a Calvinist from Grayons. Um, he had close relationship to the Germanic world. And uh, he also was a protector of the Lombard humanist Hortensio Lando, uh, a man suspected of heresy by the Roman Inquisition, who, among many other things, is the translator uh, into Italian of Thomas More's Utopia. So we have uh, a very interesting background of this map. Both these um, uh, examples we have looked at are not very much studied. There is no literature on, on this, except for very small refer little references. Uh, but um, we can look at them as a demonstration of uh, a wider circulation of this theme in the uh, early decades of the second half of the 16th century, uh, which is the flourishing period of the uh, wall maps of the world in uh, palace of power in uh, Renaissance Italy. Uh, now, what is important for me is that this commission, the commissioners of these two maps were small lords and that they were in a way also trying to escape the new hegemonic powers in Italy at the time. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, Piedmont and the, the case of the Castel of Manta, the expansion of the House of Savoy, but more interestingly, in the case of the um, Carlo Besta and the Valtellina, the uh, hegemonic uh, power of Spain and the, the Hispanic monarchy on the Duke of Milan. So uh, this is uh, an interesting point if we connect it to the fact that uh, in the Spanish part of Italy that was relevant at the time, not only the Duke of Milan, but all the southern part of the peninsula, we don't find uh, any example of word maps on the wall. So this uh, iconographic theme seems to be uh, present only in parts of Italy in which there is not the presence of Spanish power, which is something which is in, apparently in contrast to the fact that in the same years, in the 70s, early 80s, King Philip II uh, adorned his throne room with maps from all over the world. So uh, my uh, impression here is that uh, the presence of these maps could also convey a sense of contestation to the Spanish uh, power and to its pretension to have a global reach at the time. Uh, and this detail uh, is something to keep in mind while we address now the two renowned examples of the whole of the Guardaroba Nuova in Florence and the room of the world maps at uh, Caparola. Uh, my aim is not to discuss the abundant literature on these two cases uh, that have been generally studied as isolated. So there is, they have rarely been put together and looking at the backgrounds that mm, connect them. Uh, what I want to show is the relationship between the Italian peninsula uh, and the gradual consciousness of the transformation of the knowledge of the world through a number of 
connections that work behind these two maps that are particularly uh, interesting. So I want to emphasize the key role played by cultural brokers uh, who kept Italy in constant touch with this, uh, the production of this knowledge, both in the Iberian Peninsula in this, in this period, but also uh, outside Europe, because there were many um, uh, Italian uh, merchants, missionaries, uh, skilled workers that constantly sent wrappers and materials to the Italian powers that can be and must be uh, considered to understand this production. Um, because I think that this is an important background that has been disregarded for, to understand the cases of Florence and Caparola. Uh, of course, Florence and Caparola means the Medici and the Farnese family. These were two uh, great families of the period in Italy, and they had produced the most important popes of the first half of the 16th century. Here we have a very famous painting of Pope Paul III. Um, and this is important because at the time the Roman Curia had still some influence on the Iberian uh, imperial projects. For instance, it tried to control the jurisdiction of the crowns. It uh, provided some grammar to the ideological debates. And most of all, um, um, the church still claimed to have a spiritual power over the globe whose agents uh, were the missionaries. So in this period, the, um, the, the political balance of the exploration was still uh, something in which the, the church pretended to play some direct role. Uh, when the Farnese and the Medici became uh, unable to have its members as uh, pope, elected as pope in the second half of the 16th century, but these families uh, did not lose their interest in the wider world. On the contrary, as we will see. Um, and even if, the, the, from a formal point of view, the cases of um, Caparola and Florence are quite different, as we are going to see, uh, there are some uh, brokers and people behind that that are uh, the same one. And so this is very important to keep in mind. Uh, and let me introduce you a key figure in this story that has not been considered in the literature on this the famous case. It's referred to Giovanni Ricci da Montepulciano. Uh, Giovanni Ricci da Montepulciano was uh, an ecclesiastic of humble origin. He was uh, uh, at the service of the Farnese for a long time, but also kept close relationship with the Medici. Uh, it's interesting that he often visited the Iberian Peninsula, uh, where he was appointed in 1544 as Papa Nuncio first in Portugal, then in Spain. At his return in 1551, he um, was elected cardinal, so he became also to have some um, importance in, in, the, in the city of Rome, some autonomous importance. But he, uh, the, uh, previ his previous year's intense experience in, in Iberia, strongly marked uh, his behavior. He was known with the epithet of, uh, of the Portuguese, and um, um, he acted as a kind of tireless, um, sorry, uh, a tireless go-between, uh, and between the, the peninsula and, and, and the Iberian Peninsula and, and Italy, and he was probably at the time the major importer of Asiatic objects toward Italy. Um, he uh, gifted this object to cardinals and lords, first of all, the Farnese, especially Alessandro Farnese, the Gran Cardinale, uh, who was a, great, a grandson of Pope Paul III, but first of all, a, a great protector of artists, humanists, and literature, and literate, but also to Cosimo I, the Medici. Uh, we, can, we have a description of the Cabinet of Curiosity that Ricci organized in his building in uh, Via Giulia at Rome in 1558. Uh, and this cabinet reflected his test. It included, for instance, carpets, necklace objects, crystals, and jewels from India, Indo-Portuguese chists, many pieces of Chinese porcelain, and a great framed war map. The frescoes 
painted by Francesco Salviati in the northern wall, especially here, this room. I, I will show you a, a better picture now. Uh, um, in the northern wall of the great hall of his house contains biblical scenes from the life of David. However, uh, according to Sylvie de Svarte Rosa, uh, an art historian that I've worked a lot with, uh, Portuguese and Portuguese-Italian relations, uh, the, uh, the style used in this um, wall uh, would imitate Chinese hanging scrolls with painting, part in red, some of which might have been part of Richie's collection, and two Chinese, uh, and also it include two Chinese standards with personal emblem of Ricci in yellow. I'm sorry, the picture is not so fine, but I wasn't able to have access to the, to the to Palazzo to, to take pictures. And these two standards are placed side by side with two covered porcelain jars, of which we have a description uh, connected to their presence in Ricci's collection. So it seems that this uh, wall could have some uh, strong relationship with the, the collection. Now, <clears throat> Ricci shared his fascination for China with Cosimo I de' Medici, with whom he developed a close relationship exactly in the years in which he was um, creating his uh, cabinet of curiosities, late 1550s, and uh, um, um, Francesco Salviati was uh, depicting these frescoes. Um, and it is difficult to think that Ricci had no role in the conception of the whole of the Guardaroba Nuova, which Giorgio Vasari and Miniato Pitti uh, projected for Cosimo I's new apartment in the Palazzo Vecchio. The room was meant to uh, contain the uh, collections of Cosimo I, including a myriad of Chinese, of pieces of Chinese porcelain. So, uh, this is something that surely attracted very much Ricci. And the close relationship between the, the two men is confirmed, for instance, by the fact that uh, in the late 1560s, Ricci was appointed as Archbishop of Pisa, uh, a city in, in Tuscany, uh, which allowed him to have a still closer relation to, to, um, with um, Cosimo I de' Medici. Uh, the beginning of the, the depiction of these maps uh, is dated to 1564, and they were um, entrusted uh, to uh, Ignazio Danti. Now, it is probably Ricci who suggested Ignazio Danti in 1569 uh, to ask the Florentine agent Bernardo Neri, who was departing to Lisbon, to contact the Portuguese chronicler João de Barros, I quote, to get a copy of the cosmography of China that he says he translated from Chinese into Portuguese. Uh, an information that Barros, uh, the, the chronicle Barros provides in, in the Decades of Asia, his very famous chronicle of the Portuguese feats uh, in, in the Indian Ocean world. Uh, Neri was also charged with the uh, duty to discover if Barros, I quote again from Dante's letter, has any map of that country and province of China, Manji and Katai, and especially any information of the great city of Kinsai, trying to get a copy of it. So he had a precise uh, um, thing to do. Uh, and Dante stressed that there could be no finer gift for Cosimo I since, uh, I quote from the letter, no good information of the above mentioned places exist. So while Dante is depicting, he is looking for this information, uh, and the presence of Barros here is very important. Uh, and he was already uh, there in, in the case of Ramuzio, but as we will see, he's already behind the, um, the case of Caparola in a direct connection, not in just as a literary source. Uh, Probably Neri didn't met the aged Barros, 
but we are not sure about it because he, he died in the, the year later, after, in 1570. But he met uh, the Portuguese explorer and uh, fanciful author Fernão Mendes Pinto, the author of a, a very important um, travel account in, in, in Asia. And uh, he asked um, Pinto exactly a quote from a letter in which uh, Neri uh, tells his um, encounter with, um, with Mendes Pinto, the things of China and its cities, information about the things of China and its cities on behalf, explicitly on behalf of Cosimo I de Medici. Uh, beside this, uh, it seems that Neri stole uh, a Buddhist codex from, uh, from Mendes Pinto as well. So again, we have maps, materials, and this strong uh, oriental interest in, in the, the people that are behind the, the realization of these maps. Uh, the debate contained in the legend of uh, Dante's map, I'm sorry, it's very little, but it's very uh, complex debate about the different information we have of, on China and uh, in which Barrow's authority is considered the, the most important, uh, reflects this global background, this attempt to arrive to fresh news through uh, many passages, thanks to mediators, uh, as well as the fact, just to add one more example of this attitude, uh, that for the representation of Madagascar map, Dante could follow uh, Portuguese manuscripts maps available at the Medici Court. So again, this uh, uh, amount of materials that today we have lost, that we ignore, that were behind these uh, maps uh, are uh, relevant here. Uh, the map, the room of the word map uh, of the Villa Farnese at Caprarola can be approached in a similar way. In his yacht, uh, Alessandro Farnese had had Ricci as his head servant. Uh, the Grand Cardinale, who always kept a close relationship with Ricci, also because of the multiple Farnese connection uh, to Portugal, both individual of our, uh, Alessandro and his family, there, was, there were marriages between the uh, Portuguese royal family and the Farnese and the period, so this uh, reinforced the relationship. But Ricci was the man that managed many of these, concretely many of these uh, relationships. Um, um, the Grand Cardinale ordered to realize the wood maps in uh, his uh, villa in 1573, in the aftermath of his attempt to be elected pope. So there was, again, an attempt of a Farnese to become pope that was frustrated because it was elected uh, Hugo Boncompagni as Gregory XIII. Uh, uh, there is an interpretation that says that probably um, Alessandro Farnese was um, um, inspired by a project, an ongoing project at the time, uh, sorry, a, a project underway at the time in the third uh, loggia of the Vaticano showing uh, world maps. But we have to consider that in the early 70s, this uh, project was still largely incomplete. And it was only after that the um, uh, Villa Farnese's room was completed uh, that uh, Ignazio Danti uh, depicted on the third uh, loggia the two famous world hemispheres that we see. So again, these two, two men who had, uh, had fought for the, the papacy has both this interest uh, in the world, which is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, moreover, we have some written material lost, to be sincere, behind the uh, Caparola project. For instance, a discourse on the subject of the cosmography of the room of Caparola written by the project creator, Orazio Trigino de Mari. And uh, um, following this kind of material, the art historian Laurel Patridge uh, has maintained that we should interpret the room as a millenarian narrative of the history, let me go back just a second to the room, uh, of the history of mankind intended to comfort a frustrated prince of the church, Alessandro Farnese, who took refuge in his magnificent palazzo lost in the countryside of Lazio. This is the, the Villa Farnese from outside. 
While I agree with Partridge um, about the possible interpretation of this map uh, as visual historiography, I'm less convinced of the prophetic content of the iconographic program. The Grand Cardinale, who visited frequently Rich's building in Villa Giulia, something that we have always to keep in mind, that this constant immaterial contact with maps and uh, objects that might have inspired his um, taste, uh, also was strongly connected to the writing of word histories that was a rather flourishing genre in Italy at the time. Uh, even if the most popular author, Giovanni Tarcagnota, dedicated his Historia del Mondo, published in 1562, to Cosimo I, the Medici, he was a member of the circle of humanists who met under the patronage of Alessandro Farnese. So, uh, exactly as um, Ricci, also Tarcagnota is a kind of man halfway between uh, uh, Farnese and the Medici, again. Uh, we can draw a parallel, perhaps, between the way in which Tarcagnota's successor, Mambrino Roseo, continued his histories up to the present, and the possible source of inspiration behind the room of the world map at Caperola. Just as Mambrino Roseo used the letters by Jesuit missionaries as preferred documents for his world history, uh, so Farnese, who was probably the most prominent protector of the Jesuits at the time, heavily relied on their advice. If so, the idea to have not only the regions of the world, as in the case of the whole of the guardaroba depicted in the reception room, uh, including an historical comparison between the ancient Judea and the modern Italy that we have on one of the wall, uh, walls of the, of the room, but also the famous planisphere, might reflect the intention to convey a sense of Farnese's support to the real expansion of the spiritual power of the church across the globe embodied by Jesuit missionaries. And uh, this might be intended as a political act, uh, and this might um, uh, be referred also to the idea that some of these uh, maps uh, are, uh, have a kind of anti-Spanish anti meaning because we, could also, we should also remember that at the time the Spanish crown favored the, the rival orders of the Jesuits in East Asia, challenging the exclusive access, access to China of the Jesuits that were uh, understood uh, as a kind of imperial agents of Portugal. So this could be also something to be keep, kept in mind. Uh, a reading of the room as a word history culminating in the uh, a reading of the room as, as word history culminating in the global triumph of the church thanks to the Gran Cardinale is consistent with motifs in other wall of the walls of the villa that are mainly devoted to episodes of the history of the Farnese family in the 16th century, many of which are connected to important moments in European history and uh, um, political um, crisis. So this would be current, in my view, uh, with, with this presence. A further aspect to consider is that Tarcagnota and Mambrino, these two authors of the Historia del Mondo, drew inspiration uh, clearly from the popular <clears throat> histories of his time uh, by the humanist uh, Paolo Giovio, published between 1551 and 1553. Although they focus these Giovio's histories on Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, they show significant interest in the Ottoman and Safavid empires and devote famous passages to China and the New World. Giovio too was an historian writing under the patronage of the Medici and the Farnese. So once again, we have this kind of um, connection. And the passage, but more interestingly, the passages on the non-European world in his histories would rely on, I quote, a book written in Chinese and another in Portuguese, sorry, in Persian, containing some information on the manners of the Gentiles of those land, an information which is provided by Joao de Barros, again, 
who says to have given on Farnese's request to Giovanni Ricci in 1548 uh, these materials so as to have them available to Giovio. Uh, they might, might be the Tarig, the Persian uh, text might be the Tarig often mentioned by Bardas, which Professor Subramaniam has proposed to identify with the Rausat al Safa, the Garden of Purity, the encyclopedic uh, chronicle by the Persian speaking historian Mir Kvant, while the cosmography of China, mentioned in Barros' um, uh, text uh, um, with regard to the, the material sent to um, Jovia, might be the, the same book that the same material, the same object that 20 years later Dante asked Bernardo Neri to get a copy for him in Lisbon. So here again, we, we see a lot of connections that um, integrate the materials uh, of the two um, uh, map cycles. All this conveys uh, a picture of the Grand Cardinale that is rather different from that provided by Claire Robertson in Farnese's biography. Uh, the iconographic elements connected to the oceanic navigations in the planisphere of Caprarola, which are absent in all the other maps I have discussed in this presentation, uh, as well as the portraits of explorers and conquerors on the wall of the room, confirms that Farnese was anything but indifferent to the world outside Europe, as Robertson instead maintains. Uh, Hernán Cortés' portraits uh, offered him a direct link to the personage in the flesh, since uh, it is an accurate copy, this one, um, of the painting the Conquistador sent again to Jovio in 1541 for his museum on Lake Como, possibly to be displayed alongside, I quote from a Jovio's letter, a bizarre piece of an idol of Temistitan, of Tenochtitlan which he asked for to the Papa Nuncio in Spain, a further demonstration of the plurality of contexts and materials that made these artworks an example of the global renaissance. Uh, we have here another um, copy of the, of the portrait, which is today at the Uffizi, which is generally considered a copy of the, of Jovio's, uh, of the portrait that Jovio but uh, this is much more similar to the description that Jovio gives of the, of the portrait. Uh, we can conclude our itinerary asking ourselves what effects these wall maps could induce in an Italian prince of the period. Let me consider the case of Ferdinando I de' Medici, who became Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1587. You should not be surprised to learn that Giovanni Ricci had been the tutor of Ferdinando I de' Medici in his youth. Uh, after the latter's death, after Giovanni Ricci's death, it was Ferdinand, then a cardinal in Rome, who bought in 1576 the wonderful villa that Ricci had recently built on the Pinchan Hall, today known as Villa Medici. In a recent book, Leah Marchi has uh, shown to what extent Ferdinand I's test turned more and more towards the Americas, uh, thus developing his father Cosimo I's collection in a more global direction. You have here a couple of uh, frescoes that were realized in, in, under Ferdinando I that gives you an idea of it. We can make a connection between Ferdinando's uh, cultural interest and the colonial projects he dreamt of from the late 16th century on. He abandoned the purpose to have a settlement in La Rache, Morocco, where he wanted, I quote, to build the fortress and promote the navigation of his subjects from a letter of the time in 1604, only to take advantage of instability in Syria and, and try to obtain a port in the region. In, 15, in 1607. So uh, in, in these years, he's trying still uh, to have a strategy connected to the Mediterranean world and the Northern Africa, but uh, relying on the information and recommendation that uh, were sent him by his agents on the ground. But this attempt to transform personal knowledge uh, often developed at the service of private companies by these merchants, 
into state-sponsored colonial projects experienced the most dramatic moment when Ferdinand I, aiming to penetrate the Atlantic trade through settlements in Sierra Leone and above all in Brazil, organized a disastrous expedition to the New World in 1608. The Hispanic monarchy's opposition suppressed any hope for a Medici's small overseas empire. We may wonder, however, to what extent the hours spent by Ferdinando I in the whole of the Guardaroba Nuova had fostered his political ambitions. This evocative picture of the Grand Duke of Tuscany allows us to rethink the world maps whose global backgrounds I've tried to highlight in my presentation as visual traces of cultural and political orientations. This demonstrates this map demonstrates that 16th century Italy had much more tangible exchanges with the long distance interactions that marked that period that we usually admit. The world was not just on the walls, but most of all behind them. Thank you very much. For now, I'm going to talk for the discussion. Uh, we can, uh, I think you can take questions in either English yeah, yeah, or French. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, in English or French is fine. Yeah. Okay. Fanny. Can I ask you about yeah. um, the libraries? Uh, are there any traces actually in either the uh, uh, Florentine collections or the uh, uh, the others at this time of any of these uh, non-European uh, uh, textual materials? Uh, well, um, we have the cases, of course, of the, that you also mentioned, of the Mexican codes, the codices that uh, are exact, arrived exactly to Florence in these years, in Ferdinando's years, for instance. But uh, as far as we refer to the two very uh, attractive uh, sources mentioned by Joao de Barros, and luckily, I don't have any information of their presence there. Uh, there is also a, a, a very problematic point if they were really um, the copies of the originals written in Persian and Chinese, or as I think more probably uh, translated copies translated into Portuguese or something else. But as far as I know, uh, we just have an interesting um, um, comment by um, a 17th century Portuguese learned man who wrote that Jovio was very uh, unfair with Joao de Barros because he used his materials with, without mentioning him. This is an interesting thing that we could include in this attempt to look for this material and that seems to show that perhaps at least for the readers there was some evidence of the use of these materials but uh, as far as I know, there is no, uh, these materials have, have not been found in the, in the libraries. Uh, 